Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Jeff Russo, and uh, I am the composer on various Star Trek incarnations, including Discovery and Picard, um, Fargo, Legion, a number of other things, Umbrella Academy, um, and uh, a number of other projects that are upcoming. And uh, I wanted to go over a couple of uh, parts of this um, cue here from Picard, from the first season of Picard. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about how um, I build a cue, how I look at picture, and what things uh, change um, as, as the narrative continues, and, um, and what uh, instrumentation I like to use, and also the differences between when I'm working in writing and, um, and you hear the mock-up and the finished product, which is after we record and um, add a bunch of sound design and, and a bunch of uh, other cool little uh, tricks and um, uh, do's and dads and bibs and bobs and whatever, <laughs> whatever you add to make, to make it sound finished. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by playing back the finished product. Um, which uh, begins really the, the cue, I had to write the cue from a little bit earlier in the scene, but I, I started this clip sort of right as we transition to, um, to the board cube. So I'm gonna start there um, and you'll, you'll hear it, okay? Here we go. Dr. Asher. I don't mean to intrude. Um, Narek. I'm new here. Soji. That's a beautiful name. I've been reading about your work. It's, it's fascinating. I feel like I've got so many questions. And I feel like you're about to ask them. <laughs> That's nice. Your necklace. Uh, my father made it. One for me and one for my sister. I'm a twin. I had a brother. Not a twin, but we're really close. We, um, we lost him last year. Very unexpected. You're lucky to have him. I'm sorry, you spend your day fixing broken people. Um, Guessing the last thing you want when you get off work is to listen to another sad story. Guess again. That, um, <laughs> that is, that's this end cue. And, uh, you know, one of the things I really wanted to do, and you can see, so as we, as we pull in here and we change, we change feeling into a more sort of dark feeling, I wanted to, um, I wanted to give our, our Romulan friend in his, um, his introduction, uh, as special of a piece of music as I could, uh, Think of, and then I thought, well, what a great, what wouldn't it be a great idea to nod to Fred Steiner's original Romulan theme from 
the original um, from the original uh, from the original series, and I did that on where is that? I think I did it on the bassoon, right? Um, yeah, I did. So if you listen to this, um, actually. I think I need to do this. Okay. So if you listen to this part of the theme. So this this part of that melody. So that's that's a, a, a nod to, to Fred Steiner's um, to Fred Steiner's theme, and I didn't want to just use the theme in its entirety. I thought um, it would be really um, a good idea for me to and hold on, let me just put this back on time code. Um, oh, this will always match. Back here and go. Once we see him, I added oboe and bassoon. do is I really wanted that to be his entrance um, so as I built as I built that up Dr. Asher I don't mean to intrude um, Narek I'm new here Soji. That's a beautiful name. She has no idea who he is. So I'm trying to play the balance between um, him having um, having a a, a a already preconceived idea of, of how this relationship is going to go, and he has not so he's not so well intentioned, and um, and Soji being completely oblivious to it. It's interesting here as I as I play back um, this Yeah, so she likes him. She she is interested in him. And I wanted to I wanted to um, really accentuate that here. And then things start to turn a little bit. We bring it down. There's a lot of dialogue here, so I kind of need to stay out of the way. And then this tension between them is um, needing to build. I don't like to use too many uh, of the of presets that just come with things. Um, in this particular case, I messed with this uh, reverse loop and this reverse piano that's very playable. Um, and here you can kind of hear what that sounds like. Um, I really like that for him because he's very underhanded um, and yet he's also very conflicted and one of the things I liked about the, re the whole idea of doing something in reverse was there's this conflict of um, you know major and minor chords played in reverse that made me feel like okay he's trying to play two sides of one coin um, and that that really felt right to me um, but as we transition um, 59. I bring that in. He sort of changes his demeanor a little bit and 
then we start to transition to our outgoing part of the queue. Um, we needed a little pace to get us from here to the end of the uh, to the end of the uh, of the queue. interesting part is like the, these these um, short strings which come in um, and then accompanying percussion and stuff that come in they'll, they'll end up I know that they, they end up always sounding significantly different when recorded with the orchestra right so if you listen to, to just um, to just the short strings um, I'm just wondering yeah okay they're they're always played slightly even if i quantize them with delays and stuff they're always not quite out of time in a good way they just end up not playing as well as i'd like to hear them play but to the big reveal here of the Borg Cube. So the one thing that you can't really do is get it to sound like the more live orchestra. things it's very difficult to do is to get these um, to get the horn parts and stuff to play and sound as big as the as the real thing hang on let me just get this so I can do this <laughs> kind of see um, you really don't get much of the point across like if I really wanted to spend a lot of time programming those I probably could get them to um, to sound a lot more like the real thing I, I am very fortunate especially on this show that I get to um, I get to record this with an orchestra so as I'm writing it and making these um, and making these uh, um, mock-ups I, I rely on the fact that the producers for this particular show have the vision of what it's going to sound like in their head so they know that it will go from this to the next um, to the next step and take that huge, huge leap between what sounds like a mock-up um, to what sounds like it's being played by the live orchestra. Um, the, the um, here I can actually play you after the mix of the brass, this sounds more like this. So that's part, this is, that's the, the mixed part of the mock-up. So what'll, what'll usually happen is like, I sort of do, um, a, a bit of a mixed job um, with with the uh, with my mock-up and then I send it to my engineer and I have him do a bit of a better mix.
if you were listening to what the MIDI sounds like right off of my machine. And if you listen to the um, mixed stems, that's... it ends up sounding a little more like what the finished product is going to sound like. I, I, I like to deliver um, a cue that is a little more palatable for everyone. That's, you know, so they, they're going to have more of an idea of what it's going to end up sounding like um, as I build, as I build the cue. Uh, it is important though, to get this stuff sounding as good as it can, which is a lot of this percussion. And let's just listen to those this percussion part. So and if we get end up getting bigger here as we pull out. Most of this is all from you know Spitfires. Uh, a lot of it's Hans Zimmer's library, um, and some from just Spitfire percussion. Um, I do also use a couple of other things. Uh, I use East West for cymbals. For some reason, the East West cymbals just sounded so good to me that I just sort of kept on using them, um, and they're easy to use. But some of my favorite stuff are these Tombecks, um, which I really, really love. Yeah, I really do love that uh, Tombeck. Really feels right. Where is it? Um, it's here somewhere. I have to, oh, there we go. That's, that's always a lot of fun to play with. They're, they're always uh, really, really fun to play with. And usually when I'm writing, I have a, um, a Roland pad um, that I use to play uh, percussion into. I, I'm, I'm a drummer at heart, really, so I do end up, I do end up enjoying playing the, the percussion parts and, and writing those percussion parts. They, they, they're, a lot of, they're a lot of fun for me. Um, but as you as you get into something like this, you can start splitting it up and listening to it. That's where this, um, that's where this rev comes in really handy. It's like I can play the rev part in, um, you know, and play along with the um, play along with the the percussion, and it, it just all sort of feel starts to feel really interesting to me. Um, let's see what else did I have in here? You know, I do like to play the harp a lot, um, and that always ends up being such a tender instrument um, and quiet that. I usually have to turn everything up. Yeah, that always sounds really good as well. OK. 
Okay. So then that we end up with, looks like the harp went on the wrong stem, but that happens sometimes. case it was all about getting into the emotional undercurrent of this conversation slight bass hits. You know, one of the fun fun things that I have in working on a project like this is trying to find some interesting new ways of doing stuff like this bass sound is a synth. Um, so just finding the right sort of EQ curve to really work in, in conjunction with um, in conjunction with this cue. Eric Whitaker, um, the Eric Whitaker Choir Library, which is really great. We don't really have much of a budget for live choir. So the Eric Whitaker um, Library really does, really does fill that, that void right there. When, when, I need, when I need that sound, but it, it doesn't need to be, you, know, you, you could just use it as a, as a bit of a, as a bed, and it gives it that intensity of choir without having to sort of start using word builders and stuff, um, which can be so complex and really, eh, you really don't get all the way there, in my opinion. Um, but when you're using it just as, as uh, the, this sort of underneath pad type things, it really does, it really does work um, pretty well. Um, and we ended up using this. Which is the um, So when you start to get up to the super highs, um, it starts to feel, you know, slightly like okay, it's being stretched or it's being moved around, and if it's if it's hidden underneath like the big strings and stuff, it really does, it really can uh, sound very authentic. Uh, very authentic. Obviously, on its own, it can be um, it can be a little it can be a, a little fake sounding. Um, that one has always been the best one that I've ever found. Um, let's see. The other the fun part is also then checking my own work as I write parts. You know, I start being like, wait a second, is that is that um, working with these other parts. And obviously I don't need to, um, let's see. Um, I usually do it with the strings and the winds, sometimes the piano, um, which is how I usually do a main sketch. And then I'll look at it here, um, which you can see, how I can move this sort of more to the middle of the screen. Um, there we go. Uh, pull this out a little bit. Um, and I start looking at like, okay, 
um, is <laughs> is anything really really super far out. Um, usually, I can tell by looking at just this part of the screen here. Um, at mostly, it looked good to me. Um, sometimes you get things that are a little. Oh, okay, yeah, that that's not bad. Um, but this is always the fun part. Once I have the whole thing written, um, I can then listen back this way. Um, and then go, hold on. Is this on? Yes, it is. I think so. Oh, I know what's happening. That's happening. This is where I usually start to find... When I start writing lines, it's usually very easy to tell. But when I write with ensemble patches, it's sometimes not as easy to tell because my right hand chords are not great. <laughs> Yeah, um, as I as I started to add um, different melodies to the to the rhythmic strings, um, you know, it was really a question of how do I really get? Um, oh wow, that might have been one that I missed. Yeah, maybe that video that may have changed on the stage. things that, that make, makes it possible for me to um, write as fast as I need to write is the idea of setting up um, templates, right? So, um, you know, I set up these templates that have, um, you know, most of um, everything already laid out for me. Um, and it uh, it really does it really does help. Um, that way, I can just open spiccatos and know that they're going to be there, sounding exactly the way they need to sound. Um, I can open up my ensemble strings and um, have the um, have the you know the ensemble tremolos ready for me, or the <laughs> Spitfire help, um, or the um, the regular ensembles, and you know that that makes it really easy to write really quickly. Um, as I as I go from uh, as I go from one instrument to another, just knowing that the entire thing, which is laid out here on the left side of my Pro Tools, um, uh, which is all connected to this and one other Vienna Ensemble on another computer, um, that way you know I need a trumpet. I just hit trumpet, and you know it's it's pretty pretty ready to go. Um, and that's, you know, that's, uh, that makes it a little easier for me to just quickly pull stuff up. just sort of quickly sketch that way and that's that's how I'm able to sort of um, move at a, at a really fast pace I'm gonna move this back over here and then we can look at this last um, part of the queue which was really the thing that I wanted to get um, I wanted to get really really right which was the way we were going to end the queue as we reveal the um, the board cube as we sort of pull out here as you can see I know that you can um, you can see the the picture up at the top um, you can see as we pull out
I know that this is uh, <laughs> this is me just sitting here trying to go through a, a, a piece of music as it as it's written. Um, it's always somewhat easier to be uh, to have a bit of a, a back and forth with um, people who are watching, um, and uh, it it always is a little easier to sort of interact Q and A kind of thing. Um, so I, I know that there's stuff that I'm forgetting in how I built this queue, like from when I, I sat there, like one of the things I do like to do is um, sit with a piano and sketch first. I usually just use, yeah, there's the Galaxy Vintage or this, so I, I you know, I, I will sit here and just go. You know, so when I figured that out, what that was, I, I needed to figure out how that was going to play into um, play into the whole piece and how it was going to change it to go like. Ah, so I, I ended up, you know, moving to the minor third. Um. You know, just trying to figure out what those chord harmonies are going to end up being as we um, as we get farther and farther down the line in the scene. Um, you know, I, I can sit there all day, sort of. Right. Figure out what those are, play them in, and then sort of pull pull the um, pull the notes out and put them on various um, put them on various other parts. Um, so there was this main part of the sketch here. Right, Dan. Um, and I would sit there and and just mess around with that until I was like, oh yeah, that actually sounds pretty cool. And then I start sort of putting it out on a number of different, um, on a number of different instruments, you know. So I, I end up putting it on on celeste, celeste, and then end up adding vibes. And in this part before it, I use these Engelhardt bells, which I don't have in this particular um, template, uh, which is why <laughs> I I wrote this in here. Um, that's that's always fun too, you know, writing a little bit on one instrument and seeing how that same how that same thing ends up sounding in um, on another instrument. And I do that a lot with strings and winds. I do that a lot with pianos and different other hammered instruments. Um, and, uh, you know, then this part ends up sounding like, you know. In this lead up, I added a lot of low um low uh, uh sort of low frequency information and i usually use um this and we will find that i don't know if you guys can hear that so i use a lot i, I really i ended up Adding that after the fact because we needed a little more in this part of the um, in this part of the transition from the scene prior to when we are going to when we start rolling into this scene where the the Klingon bird of prey is coming in for a landing um, and we need to see this out. This is without it. So this starts to happen. And what I realized is because we had this bird of prey, we needed a little more low end. 
So I added it here, and what you'll hear is To write the cue initially, probably about two hours. Um, maybe like two, three hours to sit and sort of figure out what the, where that, first I had to have the idea of the Romulan, th using that Romulan theme. Once, once I had that, it was like, okay, how am I gonna use it here? What am I gonna do here? And then it all sort of fell together in about two hours. Um, and then, uh, and then mixing it and um, really, really working on the orchestration of it, um, probably another hour or two. So maybe a total of like five hours to do to do it. And it's like what a two and a half minute scene, I think. Um, let's see. Um, the so the whole sequence is about four minutes. But if you start from where it starts to go, it's yeah, it's about just under three minutes. Um, yeah, that's and that's about right. That's about right. Depending on the type of scene it is, you know, the the biggest um, action sequences take a lot longer. I was just working on one for Star Trek Discovery, and it took like five days to to, to really really get it because there's just there was like it's like six cues in one. Um, it was like a six, five and a half or six minute sequence, and it's a big, you know, it's a big action sequence where there's a lot of changes and a lot of pace and a lot of this and a lot of that and things happen and then not and then up and down. So there's a lot of work that goes into that kind of stuff. You know, one of the things in this queue that we needed to we we needed to have, and it's it's always an interesting note to get um, when we're when we're sitting and we're spotting, is we need to have pace here. But it can't really feel like pace. Like it can't feel like we're running because we're not. But it needs to feel like we have this motion that things are happening underneath all this, um, underneath all this emotional content. Um, and for me, a really good way to achieve that is um, with the use of, of spiccato short strings. And then with this particular character, I did end up using a lot this this reverse rhythm this reverse rhythmic loop um and that's that's sort of where it all begins and let me um play you what that actually is um and because that's that's actually a fun that's a fun thing so okay so let's see where does that begin that begins right here and you'll hear it um gives me a little bit of this underlying sort of pace that will then start to play with the, um, the short strings. And the, the really great way to build that pace um, is, um, unfortunately, with a loop-based thing, you have to start exactly on the beat. So you end up... And that gives me sort of a ticking clock. or something bowed as opposed to pits because pits sound a little um, a little too light um, but when um, I'm I also really enjoy using where are those um, so then when I wanted to bring pace then I needed to become more emotional so then the pace sort of goes away and that reverse loop stops and then it comes back again here in a different way. And that's the thing that's going to give me pace. Um, and then 
I'm back to the um, I'm back to the little bowed little bit of bowed short strings and I, I sort of try to build the parts you know every two bars or so adding a different section of the strings pace for this particular cue because there needed to be this feeling of pace as we were moving along in the whole scene but it really did need to be this one really long crescendo and for me the way to do that is to build from a very small place maybe it's just that like violins one playing those pizzicatos in this case they, they started playing um, you know a bowed shorts um, spiccato um, or spaccatissimo um, and then um, as, as you get, like every other bar, adding another instrument playing maybe in a different range or a different octave or a different mode. Um, and then you get to a certain point and you want to build it even more, you add one piece of, of percussion, maybe playing the same rhythm that the strings are playing. Um, then the neck in two bars later, adding something that's playing a counter rhythm to that, sort of add a little bit of um, counterpart. Um, and in the end, as, as more and more things get added, you get to this point of crescendo, and the you know the best way to really make it really hit home is to all of a sudden take all of it away, and then add just a big one, and then ba bum ba bum ba bum, and that that really makes it feel like it crescendos to this big moment, and then you have this big change in this big moment, and as long as that rhythm gets sort of changed and taken away, and then deconstructed again, um, it it really feels like it has gotten somewhere and it has gone somewhere um, and it really does it, it felt like it paid off here um, yeah I didn't have to use any tricks in this particular cue because the way the cue ran it really did run in a very sort of um, static way you know I, I had to make some some tempo adjustments as we were going going from 90 to 85 um, and and starting the whole cue at 84 in order to hit some of the things I really needed to hit um, but those aren't really big tempo changes or any like, you know, I didn't really have to drop a bar anywhere. I may have had to do that just in one place right here. Yeah, I went from um, being in 5-4 to being in 4-4 um, in order to really hit the, um, hit the emotional content here. And then as we get to the end, there wasn't a, there wasn't a big drop um, except for here. Um, where we transition to the ba bum ba bum I, I needed to drop to 72 beats per minute. But um, it was a pretty simplified way of looking at it. And that's really how this, this, whole, um, this whole cue was sketched and then put together and written and, um, and then recorded.